So it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Frank Franklin, um, who is an epidemiologist with applied experience in injury and forensic epidemiology. He trained in injury epidemiology and injury prevention at John Hopkins University School of Public Health, Center for Injury Research and Policy, where he received his PhD. Dr. Franklin has an MPH in epidemiology and international health from the Morehouse School of Medicine and a BS in biology from Morgan State University. Go historically black colleges and universities. He also holds a JD from the Klein School of Law, Drexel University. Dr. Franklin is pretty amazing, isn't he? Just give him a hand for being so amazing. <laughs> Currently, Dr. Franklin serves as Principal Epidemiologist and Director of Community Epidemiology Services in the Public Health Division of the Multnomah County Health Department. Let's go ahead and welcome Dr. Frank Franklin. Wow, how am I gonna follow that? No pressure, no pressure, right? Thank you all for having me here this afternoon. Let me get organized here. Um, okay. There we go. This always happens to me. Okay. All right, all right. Um, no, so let me, I want to thank Amy Fellows for inviting me here to, to speak. I really appreciate it. Thank you all for taking the time out of your day to spend with me and allowing me to spend some time with you. Um, before I start, I want to give a, some, some shout outs of, of, of gratitude and humility. Um, I'm very honored to follow Dr. Jones. Dr. Jones and I go way back um, at the Morehouse School of Medicine, primarily, CDC and some other places. I think I met Dr. Jones when I was 10 and she was 15. So just to give you some ideas, nod your head, Dr. Jones. Dr. Yes, exactly. Um, she was my professor in some classes, and then we, as I moved on, I had the opportunity to work with her on, with other graduate students and sitting on thesis committees and things of the like. And I think a year ago today, I think in February, we were in Atlanta together at a social determinants of health meeting with Michael Mormon and the, um, oh my, the acronym is escaping me, PAHO. Oh, yes. yes, yes, yes. So I, I am humbled to be here to follow you. Um, People like yourself, Dr. Thomas Levise and Dr. David Williams have um, really paved the way for this work. And you've been talking about this for a long time. And I think people have finally caught up to you. I can honestly say when I first met Dr. Jones and, and she was always very clear and focused and um, forthright about her position on race, class, and health. And I remember as some of the students, we would look in the corner and go, oh my God, did she just say that? Can we say that? Can we say that? So thank you. The, ti <laughs> the title of my talk today is uh, Cause and Effect, Race, Poverty, and Health. Let's see if I can get this right. So let me give you a little background and context on how I got here to this talk, this subject matter, and sort of how I laid it out. Um, I was asked to give some consideration to writing about the incident in Baltimore involving Freddie Gray a couple years ago. And I'm, I'm sure most of you all know the incident in Freddie Gray where he was um, taken to police custody in Baltimore and, and, and eventually, unfortunately, um, died while in their custody. And I was asked to sort of give my comments on a radio station and to um, contribute to this blog as a sort of editorial opinion, if you will, from an expert by a colleague of mine. And the title of the blog was Structural Violence, The Violative Lived Experience of the Black, Brown, and the Poor. And in that talk, I sort of explored the ideas of what it means to be violated, what violence means. As an injury epidemiologist, I focus a lot on violent crime and um, intentional injury. And it, as I was working through this piece, it, it sort of struck me and has always struck me and continues to strike me how um, the African-American male, particularly, but the African-American community, often gets characterized as being a violent community. And as I wrote through this, I, I wrote this, I explored ideas of sort of 
it's just of just the opposite. Whereas we live a violative experience, whether it's from something that's minor infractions or inconsiderations on a day-to-day -day basis, something as far as small as what you might call microaggressions or inconsiderations, all the way up to sort of something much greater, including civil liberty violations as well as political disenfranchisement, and in some cases, death, like Freddie Gray. So it always sort of struck me and, and surprised me sometime how the African-American male can be characterized as being violent, where in fact he lives a life where he is violated on a day-to-day -day basis across his life course. There was a second piece I wrote called A Tale of Two Narratives, Gender Identity, Mental Health, and the Black Male. And here, a colleague, another colleague of mine in education was, was exploring the idea of uh, mental health among African-American men and sort of some of the causative factors or how this plays out in African-American men, particularly not just mental health disorders, but overall functioning and well-being on a day-to-day -day basis. And in that piece, I explored how similarly situated men, or particularly the white male counterpart to the African-American male, although we can be similarly situated, the narratives often come out quite differently. So from there, lastly, I, uh, another colleague, again in education, asked me to sort of review an editorial or a manuscript looking at this idea of you've often heard from school to prison pipeline. And as an epidemiologist, I'm well aware of the data and the statistics, the what, the when, the where, but there's less conversation about the how and the why. Um, and so in this process of thinking about the school to prison pipeline and, and, and sort of reviewing this manuscript, I began to write and apply some of the ideas and some of the critical thinking from these two pieces to look at what contributes to this pipeline that we have often referred to, and, and to some degree, I think we have accepted it, that a pipeline exists between school and prison, particularly for African-American children. And the first place to look at this in terms of an explanatory perspective was looking at what we call chronic or toxic stress. Now, we all know that some stress is good for us. Like right now, I'm a little stressed given this talk and I'm settling in a little bit, so it's, it's keeping me very focused. But chronic stress or exposure to chronic trauma often has negative effects on children as well as adults. But with a particular focus on children, it has this sort of trajectory effect. And it affects their capacity to function in school. And long-term stress, or chronic exposure threat changes the development of the brain's prefrontal cortex, basically affecting intellectual ability or intellectual functions and emotion, emotional regulation. Now, early on in life, chronic trauma-related stress sets up the nervous system to always be on guard or hypervigilant and preparing for a threat, whether it's an imminent threat or an ongoing chronic threat. When you're in a nurturing environment, your environment communicates to you that you're safe, life is gonna be fine, it's okay to let down your guard, and be curious about the world. And when I was writing this, the piece regarding um, gender identity, mental health, and, and the tale of two narratives, if you will, I began to realize that there's a different sort of experience for the African-American male compared to the, my white male counterpart. And I, and I termed it as what I call the perpetual inquiry inquiry of identity permissibility versus the perpetual confirmation of identity prerogative. Whereas an African-American male or African-American child, you're often dealing with a, in, in a space where you're looking for some level of permission or confirmation. Is it okay to be who you are? Is it okay to be a black doctor? Is it okay to be an astronaut? Is it okay? Can I do this? Whereas the white male counterpart is always sort of, well, why can't I do this, right? So one is about permissibility, the other one is about sort of prerogative. And when I say prerogative, it's slightly distinct from this idea of privilege. Privilege is something that's often, I think of it as something that's conferred externally onto the person, or the person is subject to this privilege from an external conference of the privilege. But prerogative is something that's internal, where it's often 
afforded by privilege or instilled by privilege, but instead it's this idea that you can't imagine why you couldn't do what you wanted to do. Why couldn't you take a year off from school and travel the world? Why couldn't you do whatever it is you dream to be? And how can I tell you no, Dr. Jones? Okay, all right. She about to mess me up already. I just got started. <laughs> I feel like I'm back in graduate school, right? Okay. Oh, well, okay. Sure. So, and is there a difference between that and a sense of entitlement? Or is your identity prerogative the same as sense of entitlement? No, it's not. I think, and the distinction is, again, an entitlement for me is indicative of something that's conferred upon you, where I think often the white child or, or doesn't even know it exists. Like they can't imagine not being able to do what it is they want to do or go where they want to go. A positive environment supports an adolescent's ability to adapt, slow down, focus, and be more willing to trade immediate gratification for long-term benefits. The two environments that are, a child is initially exposed to and for the better part of their life is the home environment and the classroom environment. So I want to think about what is it about the classroom environment? What is it about the school that seems to nurture this school to prison pipeline? Again, chronic exposure to stress leads to poor executive functioning. So we have this thing called adverse childhood experiences. And let me take a quick note that I know most of you are familiar with this term, but as you begin to move forward from this day and work in this area or engage adverse childhood experiences, I would like for you all to also think about adverse life experiences. For many children who go through adverse childhood experiences, it often leads to a trajectory of adverse life experiences. And there are people of color, people of poverty, who are also experiencing ad adverse life experiences as an adult. So it just doesn't happen in childhood and then it sort of dissipates and go away. So in short, adverse childhood experiences cover abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction. Um, and again, you can see here physical and emotional neglect, emotional abuse, physical abuse, contact sexual abuse, and then sort of household dysfunction. Again, as you leave here today, I would like for you all to think about, we often talk about this idea of stable housing or um, household stability. But that's more about, it's, I think people often use it with the parenthetical idea in mind that the person isn't physically moving from house to house or they have a stable home environment. But you can have a stable home environment physically and have an unstable household inside. Across all groups, black and Hispanic children were exposed to more adversities compared to white children. ACEs are associated with behavioral problems. Children with two or more ACE events are eight times as likely to demonstrate behavioral problems and twice as likely to repeat a grade in school. An estimated half of all school-age children have never experienced an ACE, yet among the half who have experienced an an ACE event, they account for 85% of the behavioral problems. Again, looking at the number of ACE exposures and the percentage of children who experience learning behavioral problems. In short, chronic or toxic stress challenges a child's ability to moderate their emotional regulation or disappointments or provocations. And chronically looking out for threats produces patterns of behavior that are self-defeating in the school environment, such as talking back, fighting, acting up, and an overall level of distrust of teachers and connecting with peers. In short, greater exposure of ACEs, there's a greater risk for learning disabilities and poor psychological development. Chronic exposure to stress disrupts the cognitive development of executive function i.e. working memory, attention, cognitive flexibility, the ability to navigate unfamiliar situations which can often cause stress, processing new information, 
in short, distractions and directions divided by an impaired executive functioning results in frustration or frustration or frustrating experience from day to day. These neurocognitive disabilities result in students, and again, we're talking, when I talk about students here, this occurs pretty much first, second, and third grade. It impairs their ability to read on time and grasp a sense of numbers. All in all, more stress, more behavior problems, and then we move to stigmatization and punishment. Now here on the slide on the right, you see something called the third grade phenomena. Um, and I'm very fortunate as an epidemiologist to get the opportunity to work in many fields with many different people of different disciplines. And um, often that's because of the fact of social determinants of health, which we all are familiar with, co contribute to many of the chronic diseases and conditions we, we have today. So my colleagues in these other sectors often pull me in. And one of my uh, colleagues at Hopkins who was spearheaded a lot of the research at their School of Education, you know, we talked about some of the reports that they put out regarding what I call a third grade phenomena, where the data shows at third grade they can tell the likelihood that a student, how likely a student will succeed, succeed being completing high school, succeed being not going to prison, succeed being not dropping out, the like. And I couldn't understand um, what, what, what's happening at third grade, what's so magical at third grade, you know, what's, What's the difference between second and third or fourth and fifth? And, and after some discussions, I came to the point, and, and somewhat confirmed by my colleagues, so I have to give her a little credit as well, um, that at third grade, you, you begin to transition from this, this space of, from zero to three, it's about learning how to read. But after third grade, when you go into fourth grade, you have to read in order to learn. And if you haven't learned to read, it becomes incredibly difficult to read in order to learn and, and attach to higher concepts. Student has a bad attitude, behavioral problem, bad attitude, or they get diagnosed with something, defiant personality diagnosis, yet it is more of a function of a poorly regulated stress response system. Talking back or acting up in class in part is symptomatic of the child's inability to control his or her impulses, emotions, or feelings. By the time she arrives in middle or high school, he or she, with the poor executive func functioning, is already characterized or stigmatized as problems of having a bad attitude or poorly motivated, i.e., the child has a behavioral problem, and it should be met with discipline. Harsh punishments are ineffective in motivating troubled adolescents to succeed. But the cycle begins. Higher stress, and it doesn't matter where you start on this circle here, it just goes round and round, right? And it becomes sort of um, self-perpetual -perp -perp or um, perpetuated, exactly, thank you. I gotta bring you more to more of my talks. <laughs> So schools take this behaviorism approach. Positive reinforcement translates into doing the behavior more. Negative reinforcement translates into doing the behavior less frequently or not at all. On a short-term basis, this may, be, this may be effective. It may have a positive impact. However, long-term, it's not sustainable. American schools have adopted this philosophy rooted in the 1980s and 1990s that schools are safer and more effective in the context of zero tolerance or a zero tolerance response, whether, that, whether that's in relationship to violence, drug use, and or other categories of misbehavior. This philosophy stems from law enforcement and the criminal justice system. And once you look at the slide there, and the gentleman who's holding this, this placard or this board, it reads, let's give kids an education, not a prison record. I want you to think about that when we connect or when you think of suspensions, right? Because it seems like a, a big leap between a suspension um, or some type of punishment to a prison record or to liking it to liking it, likening it to a prison record. Let's take Chicago, for example. During the 2013-2014 school year, 27% of the students who live in the city's poorest neighborhoods received an out-of-school suspension in comparison among the students who reported a personal history of abuse or neglect 
the suspension rate was 30%, slightly higher. Among the out-of-school suspensions in public high schools, 60% are infractions that, did not, that do not involve violence or threat of violence. Instead, they're mostly for talking back, violating school rules, or some type of disruptive behavior. So I, I spent some time last night updating some of these slides, Amy, which is why we never get them to you enough time. Um, and Amy was looking at me side-eyeing when I walked in, and she was like, where are my slides? Um, so in 2010, more than a tenth of public high school students nationwide was, was suspended at least once. And so when I read that, I thought, oh, I should update this because I know I'm going to get a question from someone. Well, that was almost 10 years ago, Dr. Fredlin. Has anything changed? Well, African-American students then are suspended three times as often as white students. In 2015, 2016, African-American students faced greater rates of suspension, expulsion, and arrest than their white classmates from the civil rights data collection. The number of students being referred to law enforcement has increased. Black students accounted for 15% of the student body, yet represented 31% of the arrests. Now, two years earlier, black students accounted for 16% of the student body and 27% of the arrests. So we have slightly 1% fewer students, but the rest rates still seem to go up. Right? So suspensions, arrest rates, prison records, school, school to prison, blacks, boys. Among adults reporting an ACE exposure and less than a high school education, there was a greater prevalence of physical abuse, an incarcerated family member, substance abuse, separation, or divorce. The rate of ACE exposure for poor children is at least twice as high as children from higher incomes. So we have black and poor children who lead their lives into adulthood who may not have graduated from high school with greater exposures to adverse childhood experiences. But it leads to two different narratives particularly in terms of gender. Compared to girls, boys experience lower rates of high school graduation and college attendance. Boys are more likely to get into trouble, which impairs their ability to successfully enter the job, mar job market. Although the gender gap is consistent across the United States, the gap is much larger for poor people and for African Americans. The inequity, is more un the inequity in society and the more unequal society becomes, the greater impact is faced by boys. In the United States, compared to the white population, African Americans are disproportionately disadvantaged. And reducing disadvantages has the potential to reduce the gender gap as well. Research has shown greater family investment in children results in stronger protective factor for boys. It's protective for both boys and girls, but the research has shown that it's even greater for boys. Boys appear to be more sensitive to extreme or chronic stress. By the time boys from poor neighborhoods enter kindergarten, they are already less prepared compared to their sisters. Boys from poor neighborhoods are more likely to be suspended, skip school, perform poorly on standardized tests, drop out of high school, commit crimes as juveniles, and have behavioral and learning disabilities. So we see the connection. Overall, boys tend to have more discipline problems than girls, yet the difference is much greater for black and Latino boys. More than half of this difference among black and Latino boys can be attributed to poverty and related problems. The Astor School here in Portland a K through eight public high school in the low-income part of Portland, Oregon, more than half of the students are economically disadvantaged, and, and nearly half of the disadvantaged students are minorities. Problems in elementary school lead to long-term effects. Early suspensions are strongly associated with not graduating from high school. Boys are not born this way. Although disadvantaged children are more likely to be to be in poor performing schools or neighborhoods with drugs and violence, this in and of itself does not explain the gender gap. So down this road of sort of explaining 
what's happening and then how that leads into a different narrative, not only between black boys and white boys, but also between black boys and their black female counterparts. I, and one of the, I've given this talk before and, and, I, and I have this slide up here that reads a carceral state of being. And um, the reason I have a definition here on several occasions or at least once or so, I guess, um, someone mentioned to me, well, the crowd might not understand carceral. And um, I, I, I've never taken it out of the slides. So I think it's important to, to not just hear the def see the word or um, give you a definition for some type of um, definition's sake. But um, when you look at it simply of relating to or suggesting a jail or prison. So a lot of the data, a lot of things I've shown you here sort of leads to the school to prison pipeline. So that's sort of cut and dry. But then you have people who may not necessarily, you know, there are a lot of African-American males who have not been in prison, right? But they still live in this existence that is sort of prison-like. Or again, going back to this idea of perpetual or inquiry of permissibility versus prerogative, right? So the boundaries are shaped different compared to the white male counterparts. Or the boundaries for a African-American student are often shaped different, if not literally, which I, agree, I would argue they are, but definitely within the um, student's mind because of the narrative and the experience that they um, have to navigate through on a day-to-day -day basis. So I, I think it's important to sort of keep carceral and not just think of it in terms of whether or not you have a prison record or a probation officer, but think about it in terms of how you navigate this world and how this world navigates against you or with you, your choice, how you like to look at that. The number of federal and state prisons in 2016, approximately 1.5 million. Here, in terms of male and gender, we see 93% are male. In terms of race and ethnicity, we see uh, 300 or 22% are Hispanic, 42% are black or African American, and 36% are white. As of 2016, for every 100 U.S. residents, for every 100,000 U.S. residents, there's about 400 white men in prison, 24 or 2,415 and 1,000 or 1,092 Hispanic men. That's 2.5% of the total black population. Now ages 18 and 19 were 11.8 times more likely to be in prison than white males of the same age. Rates of incarceration have been the most dramatic among undereducated African-American males under the age of 34. In a 2003 report looking at people looking at education and imprisonment, 40% of the state prisoners had not finished high school or equivalent. 40% males versus females, 44% African Americans, 52% 24 years of age and younger, 61% were non-citizens, 59% had a speech disability or impediment, 66% had a learning disability, and 47% were drug offenders. Approximately 17% of the inmates experienced abuse prior to prison. 18% were physically or sexually abused. 92% knew abusers and 47% had been a parent. And 47% of those who knew abusers knew their abusers. The abuser was a parent or guardian. So in conclusion, when I, what I would like you guys to think about when concerning the tale of two narratives of gender identity, mental health, and the black male, I came to this realization that regardless of health behaviors, the inequitable burden of mental health disorders and undiagnosed need borne by black males is also a consequence of racial discrimination and race-related stressors. The narrative of the African-American male can be characterized as a perpetual inquiry of identity permissibility the narrative exemplifies a lived experience of boundaries and freedoms fundamentally shaped by the social construct of race. So I've attempted to explain 
this prison or this school to prison pipeline. And in my line of work, we often try to explain the mechanisms of injury and disease. And as we move forward in this work, looking at race, class, equity, and social determinants of health, and social determinants of health and equity or an equity period, people are always asking me, you know, well, how can I, how can I advance and get behind this and do better? Or explain to me why this works. And, and Explaining something to someone is really about sort of helping them advance cognitively or knowing something or having the knowledge to move towards some level of acknowledgement. But although you know something or you may sort of acknowledge that it exists, you may never fully understand. But it's important to try to know and move towards acknowledgement of the idea of how race plays out in day-to-day -day lives of people, not only black people, but people of other ethnicities. Um, and to understand is really to sort of have the experience. It's like, I may know what it's like to sort of experience something, but it may seem totally different for a person that, a female or a person of another nationality. Um, so knowing something doesn't really mean you understand it. Being racially sensitive doesn't really mean you understand it. Being racially competent in something or um, doesn't really mean you understand it, but you have to begin to get moved towards acknowledging that it does exist and it goes on every day. So thank you very much. I just had a few comments as you were speaking. It was very interesting. Um, I've been to other lectures where they talk about uh, the, person. The, the black ex, uh, American experience and the reason why there are so many premature births among the black families and um, what it came out that there is so much stress in these women's lives. So many more uh, black children are born prematurely than um, white uh, children and that sets up right away for the infant in, in utero, feeling the mother's stress, and also being born prematurely, which brings additional stress to the family and to the child. And so that's one, perhaps another element. Um, the other thing I want to mention, two more things, but the third grade that you mentioned, I, I am a teacher of almost 50 years. And um, what I noticed in third grade, which I've taught um, extensively also, is that by that age, the children become more self-aware. And right at that age, too, uh, the importance of the family starts to get surpassed by the importance of the peer group acceptance. And so amongst their peers, all of a sudden, the kids kind of realize why this one child is being taken out for speech or taken out for... Um, whatever uh, they want to give the student extra abilities for. So even though the child is, may even be getting that extra um, help, they are stigmatized in, they feel in the face of their peers and they're aware of that. Um, in some schools, um, reading is not as emphasized. I know like in the Waldorf schools, very expensive school to attend, but, um, but they don't emphasize reading. They, they do a lot of different kinds of experiential learning. Um, I'm not saying anything else except that they have a feeling that reading doesn't come until eye teeth are, are coming in and, and other things like that. But third grade is a very um, uh, pivotal grade. That's um, where the up until very recently, that's when testing started in the classrooms, too, in third grade. The last thing I wanted to say was um, I had an opportunity to receive a around-the-world travel sabbatical for a year. And what I noticed was in countries like Zimbabwe, where uh, I was a minority as a white person, uh, a very different feel about the... Um, the, the a black, uh, uh, um, I don't know, I want to say family, the population, because 
theirs was the ownership of the country. And um, I was a visitor, and all the whites were visitors, even those who had residence there. Um, when it turned from Rhodesia to Zimbabwe, there was a major change in the um, expression of the, uh, the people, the, the black people. And so um, because our country here, we have the whole slavery and civil rights experience and things, um, I don't know how it would be in all the other countries where there are whites and um, blacks and minorities. And in England, I didn't notice that much of a um, of an exterior feel of, of the different races, uh, maybe more of a melting pot, but then again, um, I wasn't there long enough to really understand that. But I just wanted to share those points. And if you had any comments, I would be interested. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I, I do have some comments towards the, the last couple of things you mentioned about um, being in another country and sort of um, how that experience was for you and, and your observation. And, I, I, I don't know if I want to say frequently, but on more than one occasion, I, I, I hear from an individual who happens to be um, not of color or a, a white person, if you will, when they visit these other countries. And um, there's this idea that because there's a greater prevalence or the country is uh, African, you know, on the African continent, or there's a greater number of people of hue that, um, that this idea that racism or race doesn't exist, right? So, but there's, then there's different metrics or different machinery or apparatuses of discrimination, whether it's class, whether it's sort of nationalism. We, we've just happened to perfect this thing called race and racism in the United States. But in other countries it exists, but it's probably called something else, but it looks the same. You will see that the distribution of, of um, let's just to be, to be charitable, the distribution of, 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 of poor well-being is still heavily, um, or there's a greater proportion of it in people of color. Um, so I, I, I don't know if it's any better. I think it's, it just operates differently, to, so different means to the same end. Um, Do you feel that African American yes boy has been misdiagnosed as having a learning disability. The reason I ask as a parent and a grandparent of males, uh, my grandson can play a video game backwards, forwards, and any time you put in front of them, but then they want to diagnose them with uh, having learning disabilities. How do we as adults, parents and all, how do we keep this from happening to our children? So let me, let me try to get to the first question. I, I, I do believe in many instances, and there's research to support the sort of the misclassification of, of African-American males into this diagnostic box. Um, often schools are not in a position, and it happens to fall on school just because schools are the, sort of the next place after the, after the child leaves home, are not in a position or not prepared to um, accommodate the narrative of inner city children, whether they be black, brown, or, or poor. So we, we spend a lot of time trying to counter the narrative with the diagnosis, right? But instead of accommodating the narrative, and then, and if the diagnosis is legitimate, in many instances, the child does not need to be tracked indefinitely. And how that's often prevented is having the advocacy at the schools. Many mothers and fathers of poor inner city kids do not have the advocacy there to make sure that the child gets to services, is mainstream, not separated out to another classroom. Um, so it's really having that advocacy, and that advocacy costs. Um, so yeah. Yep. I think it's, I got the time here. Am I, am I getting kicked off now? <laughs> okay, thank you.